fact, I just bumped into somebody in the hallway earlier and, and we ended up talking about it and he had a very different perspective on the whole talk than I did. That just happens because we had a collective experience and we're, we're walking around. Welcome everyone. Come on in and sit down and fasten your seat belts. It's gonna be a wild ride. There's gonna be trumpet players and airplanes and lawnmowers and races and contention and mayhem and yelling and getting kicked in the head. And strawberries, there'll be plenty of strawberries. And you thought this was gonna be a talk about C++. This is an example of concurrency. And in symphony orchestra, the musicians make music at the same time. Different musicians, or at least different groups of musicians, are playing different things, but they all work together to produce a single product, a beautiful performance. They do this by synchronizing their playing. To get the desired effect, they all have to play their music at precisely the right time. The source of this synchronization is, of course, the conductor. By watching the conductor wave his arms, making entrances, keeping the beat, and indicating cutoffs, the musicians know exactly when to play their notes. Without some mechanism to keep the musicians in sync, the cacophony would be unbearable. With a good synchronization method, mechanism, the result is spectacular. Another ex example of concurrency is commercial air travel. Pre-pandemic, there were about 30,000 commercial flights per day over the United States, each of them doing their own thing, flying their own route. Some work has to be done to avoid mid-air collisions, but it's not too difficult, at least at cruising altitude, because there are more than five million square miles of airspace. From a concurrency point of view, if not from an environmental perspective, air travel is quite efficient. The place where synchronization and coordination between planes is much more common is, of course, the runway. Each of the 30,000 daily flights needs to take off and land on a runway at just 500 or so airports, with more than half of all commercial traffic going through the top 30 airports. Because the lives of the passengers and crew depend on airplanes not colliding, access to the runway must be restricted to one plane at a time. What was a highly parallel activity in the air becomes a sequential activity at the boundary between the air and the ground. At busy air airports, there is lots of contention for use of the runways, leading to backups and long lines with planes blocked from progressing while waiting to acquire the right to use the runway. While, while synchronization of access to the runway leads to inefficiencies, it is absolutely vital for safety and correctness. Welcome to my talk about the basics of concurrency. I am David Olson, Principal System Software Engineer at NVIDIA, and technical lead of the front end of NVIDIA's HPC C++ compiler, NVC++. A big part of my job for the last seven years has been getting standard C++ code to run in parallel on GPUs. So unlike my previous two Back to Basics talks, I have some familiar, familiarity with the topic this time. I will talk about how to do concurrency in C++, but more important than knowing how to do it in C++, is understanding how to think about concurrency. You can't write correct concurrent code in any language without being able to recognize race conditions or understand the effects of synchronization. I will take every opportunity to try to explain the higher level concepts behind the code. Orchestras and airplanes won't be the only real world examples in this talk. A couple of administrative notes. The slides are already posted in the Discord channel for this session and many of those slides have clickable links in the corner, such as this example slide. I don't expect you to read the links and type them in now during the session, but to later use the slides to click on the links that you think are interesting. Most of the slides with example code have a compiler explorer link that will take you to a full program that compiles and runs. But these links are less useful than you might think because compiler explorer seems to run things on a single x86 core so the data races in the examples don't manifest themselves easily. On slides that talk about C++ standard classes, the clickable link points to the CPP reference page for that class. So you can easily read about all the important details that I don't, didn't have time to mention. Now it's time to start the talk. 
What is concurrency? In a talk here four years ago, Daisy Holman defined concurrency as multiple logical threads of execution with unknown inter-task dependencies. That's a pretty solid definition, though I quibble a bit with the word unknown. That made sense in the context of Daisy's talk, where unknown referred to the scheduler that was scheduling the tasks. But it doesn't really work for this talk. So I am changing unknown to sum. Concurrency is multiple logical threads of execution with some intertask dependencies. Great, we have a definition. But, it, but I bench, bet a bunch of you here out there don't have any idea what that actually means. Multiple logical threads of execution means doing things at the same time. There are multiple airplanes in the sky above us on approach to Denver Airport right now. On your team at work, multiple people are working on the same project or product. Intertask dependencies can mean that some things must happen before other things. For example, when several people are working together to clean the kitchen after a meal, the dishwasher must be unloaded before the dirty dishes can be loaded into it. And the leftover food must be put away before the counters can be wiped clean. Different people can do those tasks, but they must coordinate so that one is done before the other. Intertask dependencies can also mean that some things can't happen at the same time, even if the order doesn't matter. In our airplane example, different planes cannot take off and land from the same runway at the same time. It doesn't really matter which one goes first, only that they don't happen at the same time. Logical threads of execution can refer to lots of different kinds of things, and we'll cover that a bit near the very end. But for most of this talk, I'll just refer to threads, by which I mean threads within a single process running on the CPU. CPU threads are the kind of logical thread of execution where C++, C++ provides the most tools to manage them. So that's the easiest thing to talk about. We're going to manage our inner task dependencies, both the A before B kind and the not at the same time kind, through synchronization. I will show you several ways to synchronize threads so you can control the order of events and safely pass data between threads. Related to, but not quite the same thing as concurrency, is parallelism. In the same talk four years ago, Daisy defined parallelism as multiple logical threads of execution with no intertask dependencies. I like that definition. I have no quibbles with it. The key difference from concurrency is that with parallelism, there should be no dependencies. This gives the scheduler more freedom to schedule the task, and it means you won't be slowed down by the synchronization between threads. An example of parallelism is picking strawberries. If your strawberry field has 50 rows and you've hired 10 workers to pick the strawberries, and you tell those 10 workers to all start at the same place in the field and to pick the next available strawberry, you would have mayhem. The workers would be tripping over each other, literally, and a lot of time would be wasted jostling for the next available spot, picking only a few strawberries there, and then having to find another spot. The large amount of contention for each of the strawberries causes a lot of inefficiency. A much better strategy is, of course, to assign each of the 10 workers their own five rows. That eliminates all the dependencies between workers and allows each person to pick berries as efficiently as possible. That solution is obvious, and it's what the workers in this picture are doing. We all know inherently that it is best to minimize dependencies. That intuitive real-world guideline is just as true, probably more true, in concurrency and parallelism. Concurrency is hard. Let me tell you how to do it the easy way. Well, sort of. There is no easy way. There is one approach that does make it a little less hard. And that's to do parallelism, not concurrency. If you can eliminate all the dependencies between your threads, you will eliminate almost all the headaches and gotchas and nasty bugs that trip people up. And the best way to do parallelism is with C++ 17 parallel algorithms. Let the implementation do all the hard work of managing the threads and of managing the dependencies that are inherent in some of the algorithms. All you have to do is make sure there are no dependencies in your code. Bryce had an entire talk on the parallel algorithms many years ago, and I covered them in some detail four years ago. 
This talk is not really about parallel algorithms, so I will touch on them quickly right now. I told you I was serious about giving the big picture. We're 10 minutes into the talk, and this is the first mention of C++. A parallel algorithm is any standard algorithm that takes an execution policy as its first argument. There are four standard execution policies which allow you to request that the compiler vectorize the algorithm or run the algorithm in parallel or both. But the important thing here is that when you use a parallel algorithm, you are making a promise to the compiler. You are promising that your code is safe to run in parallel, which means it has no data races. And if you request vectorization, you almost promise, you also promise that there are no locks in your code. If your code already uses the C++ algorithms that have been around since the late 90s, then it might be really easy to parallelize your code. Just add an execution policy as the first argument of the function call. Your code may also have some raw loops that are just screaming to be changed to an algorithm. Here's one that adds up all the numbers in a container. Here's the first attempt. Just use the for each algorithm to run some arbitrary code on each element. But that doesn't work. There is a data race. Multiple threads might be modifying the variable sum at the same time. So let's try something else. Still for, still for each, but use a mutex to prevent the data race. This will get the right answer, but the performance is abysmal, many times worse than the original loop because there is so much contention for the mutex, similar to the strawberry pickers wanting to pick the same strawberry at the same time. Don't do this. We are having problems with contention because we are using the wrong algorithm. This is a reduction, so we should use the reduce algorithm. There is still some synchronization between threads so that they can work together to produce a single result, but the implementation takes care of that and, shows, and knows how to minimize it. So this time, the parallel version is faster than the sequential. Here are just a few of the available parallel algorithms. You have the ones that just iterate over a sequence, performing an arbitrary action on each element, and algorithms for searching through a sequence, and ones that mutate the sequence, and algorithms that sort in various ways, and numerical algorithms for redu reductions and scans. The most powerful algor algorithm among these is often regarded to be transform reduce. In a single call to transform reduce, you can count the number of words in a string or solve the traveling salesman problem of finding the best route that visits all the nodes in a graph. To summarize this section, use C++ standard parallel algorithms when appropriate. Try to use the best algorithm for your particular task. Spending time learning about all the algorithms is likely a good investment. And most importantly, make sure your code doesn't have any data races. Now, finally, we can start talking about how to implement concurrency in C++. To create a new thread in C++, use class std thread. Here's the concurrent version of hello world. The main thread creates a new child thread and passes a value to it. The child thread prints hello from thread and the value. When the child thread is done printing message, the main program exits. In this example, my thread is a variable of type thread. My thread is not the child thread itself, but lives in the main thread and is a handle that the main thread can use to manipulate in very lim limited ways the child thread. The std thread constructor takes a callable, which is anything that can be called like a function. In this example, it's a lambda that takes one integer argument. Any argument for the callables are are passed as arguments to the thread constructor immediately after the callable itself. The thread constructor will pass these arguments onto the callable when the thread is started. The thread constructor will create a new thread within the process and it will schedule the thread to run the given callables within the with the given arguments. Exactly when the thread starts running depends on the operating system scheduler, but it usually starts running almost immediately. Once the child thread has been scheduled to run, the std thread constructor returns, and the parent thread continues running at the same time as the child thread. The parent thread does not wait for the child thread to finish before continuing. Launching a thread is asynchronous. This is how we do multiple things at the same time that was talked about in the definition of concurrency. 
When the main thread is ready for the child thread to be done, it should call join. If the child has already completed, join returns immediately. If the child thread is still running, the call to join blocks until the child thread is complete. Join doesn't return anything. There is no way to return a value from the child thread to the parent thread. Using std thread is not like an asynchronous function call with a return value. Later, I will cover some ways that the child thread can pass information back to the parent thread. If you don't care about when the child thread finishes, you can call detach instead of join. A thread that has been detached will be cleaned up by the operating system once it is done running. It is generally better to call join than detach if you have a choice. Save detach for when it's necessary, such as when the child thread has to live longer than the std thread variable that owns it. Whether you choose to call join or detach, you must call one of them. The destructor of std thread will call std terminate if the thread has been neither joined nor detached. At least this mistake of forgetting to call one of them will result in a reliable crash that you can easily debug and fix. Some other concurrency mistakes result in failures that are impossible to debug. I just told you how to use std thread. Now I'm suggesting that you don't use it. Std thread is a low level tool that is best used by threading libraries and task management libraries. If your current project is already using such a library, use that rather than std thread. If you're looking for a task management library to use, unfortunately, I don't have any suggestions. I'm not familiar enough with what is out there to make recommendations with any confidence. There aren't any good tools in this area in the C++ standard, but senders and a static thread pool will be coming in C++ 26. Even if you aren't using std thread directly, it is useful to know how it works because the library will have operations similar to std thread. There will always be a way to start concurrent work, probably by passing a callable and its arguments similar to std threads constructor. There will be a way to wait for the task to complete, similar to thread join. The synchroni synchronization rules for thread creation and thread join that we will discuss later should also apply to the corresponding operations in the library. As a bonus, the library might have an easy way for the concurrent work to return a value, which std thread does not offer. Next, we move on to the topic that I think is the most important part of this talk, data races or race conditions. The C++ standard uses the term data race. When I first tried my hand at concurrent programming many years ago in Java, I learned the term race condition. If there is a technical difference between them, I don't know what it is. I will use them interchangeably in this talk. <coughs> You think I'd know how to drink by now. <coughs> In a broad sense, we'll get to the technical definition later. A data race happens when two or more th things try to use a resource without coordinating with each other. When there is a data race, bad things can happen. What those bad things are can vary widely and depends entirely on the situation. Sometimes a data race won't cause anything to actually go wrong. If you are lucky, the data race will result in a crash during testing, so you have a chance to fix the problem before it gets out into the wild. If you are really unlucky, a data race will result in an incorrect value that gets stored away in a database somewhere, and no one notices until your accounts don't balance and you cannot figure out what went wrong. Some real world examples of data races. Let's say I was responsible for counting the number of people attending this session. Since I can't do that while I'm talking, I would try to count just before starting, which is when lots of people are entering the room and some are leaving. That wouldn't go well, because the number of people would keep changing on me. That's a read-write conflict. I would be trying to read the number of people in the room while others are modifying the number by going in and out. Another example is two people trying to walk through a door at the same time. That's not gonna work and someone is likely to get hurt. We have all learned how to avoid this race condition with, by coordinating with the other person. Through, first through subtle signs like slowing down, and if that doesn't work, by stopping and saying, after you. 
People who grew up playing baseball or softball like I did know that outfielders are taught from a very young age to call for a fly ball by yelling, I got it, if they think they can catch it. This is a form of synchronization to avoid the race condition of two players trying to catch the ball at the same time. When that synchronization fails, bad things can happen. Not just a dropped fly ball, but physical injuries, such as the concussion that I received when I dove for a ball that I didn't call for and got kicked in the head. Like I said, bad things happen when there are data races in your code. You won't get literally kicked in the head, but sometimes it might feel like you were. Here's a somewhat technical definition of a data race in C++ code. It happens when one, two or more threads access the same location in memory. Two, at least one of those threads writes to that memory. And three, the threads do not synchronize with each other. The C++ standard has a more precise definition of what it means to synchronize, but it would not be in the best use of our time to go over that in detail here. A data race is undefined behavior according to the standard. In practice, a data race usually results in an incorrect, possibly random value of an object being read or written. Depending on how that value, how that object is used in your program, the incorrect value of the object can cause almost anything to happen. Avoiding data races is all about the visibility of memory and the changes made to that memory. When two threads synchronize with each other, the programmer has some guarantees about which memory changes made by one thread are visible to the other thread. The memory for a process is not a monolithic thing that is kept in sync such that all threads in the process see the same thing. On some systems, and this is especially true of modern high performance computers, each thread might have its own copy of part of the process's memory. An explicit synchronization may be necessary for different threads in the same process to see the same values in memory. Let's put this definition of data race that we just learned to work. Is there a data race in this code? The goal of this code is to create a very simple financial report for a company, listing the company's net worth, the total value of durable goods, and the total value of the long-term debts. The calculations of each of these numbers can take a while, so to be efficient, we want to use concurrency to do the various calculations at the same time. So we create a background thread to calculate the durable goods, and a background thread to calculate the long-term debts. And while both those threads are doing their thing, the main thread calculates the net worth. Once the main thread finishes calculating the net worth, it calls join on both of the child threads to make sure they are both done before continuing. That ends the concurrent portion of this block of code. <clears throat> now let's analyze the code to see if there are any data races. The first memory location we will look at is the container of assets. The main thread writes to assets and the durable goods child thread reads assets. That fits the first two parts of the definition of a data race. One, two threads access the same memory location, and two, one of those threads writes to the memory. What about condition three? Do the two threads synchronize with each other? Yes, they do. Creating a new thread is a synchronization point. All changes to memory that happen in the parent thread before the child thread is created are visible within the child thread. This is the only guarantee you get. Changes that the child thread makes are not necessarily visible to the parent thread, and changes that the parent thread makes after thread creation are not necessarily visible to the child thread. In our example, the two threads that access the assets container synchronize with, either, with, the, with each other in between the write and the read. So the results from writing the assets are guaranteed to be visible. The third part of the de definition of a data race does not apply. So this is not a data race. The exact same reasoning applies to the collection of liabilities. It is written in the main thread, accessed in the child thread, but that's okay because the two threads are synchronized by thread creation. Now let's look at a different variable with a different access pattern. The variable that holds the total value of the durable goods is written to in the child thread, and we read it in the parent thread. Again, that satisfies the first two conditions of a data race. So we look at the third condition. Do the threads synchronize in between? 
Again, the answer is yes. Joining a thread is a synchronization point. All changes to memory that happened anywhere in the child thread are visible to the parent thread after the call to join returns. This is one way to get results from a child thread back to its parent thread. Detaching a thread does not have this property. When you call thread detach, there is no synchronization. If you want to get data out of a detached thread, you need to use some other synchronization method. So the use of the variable durable goods in this example is fine because the two threads synchronize in between the write in one thread and the read in the other thread. I have one more potential data, data race to investigate. The assets collection is accessed by the durable goods child thread and it is also accessed by the parent thread while the child threads are running. This satisfies the first condition of a data race. There isn't any synchronization between the accesses because both of them happen in between the thread creation and the thread join. That's the third condition for a data race. But we're okay. Both accesses are reads. There aren't any writes to the assets collection in between the synchronization points. So the second condition of a data race is not satisfied. To answer the original question, there is no data race in this chunk of code. A pleasant con conclusion from all this analysis is that many common code patterns used in concurrency do not contain data races. Thanks to the synchronization points at thread creation and thread joining, you can avoid data races if one, any data that a child thread modifies is not accessed in any way from any other thread during the lifetime of the child thread, and two, any data that a child thread reads is not modified by any other thread during the lifetime of the child thread. Those two rules can cover a significant number of concurrent use cases. But what about all the others, where data needs to be both read and written to while both threads are running? For that, we need more ways to synchronize. We'll come back to look at more data race examples later after we look at some synchronization techniques. The first such technique is mutexes. The term mutex is short for mutual exclusion, which is a good description of its primary purpose. A mutex can be locked by only one thread at a time. The basic idea behind this is that any code that is written, that is, sorry, that is within the region where a mutex is locked can be run by only one thread at a time. This makes mutexes the most basic form of synchronization in C++ and in many other languages. Before we look at C++ examples of mutexes, here are some real world examples of mutexes to help you understand the idea behind them. An airplane lavatory is an example of a mutex, or more precisely, the lock on the door is a mutex. Any one person can go into the bathroom and lock the door. Once the door is locked, the person has exclusive, exclusive use of the lavatory. No one else can get in and interrupt them within reason. When the person unlocks the door and leaves, the next person can go in and lock the door. A mutex takes a potentially concurrent activity and forces it to be sequential. Another example of a mutex is a talking stick, not the kind used in Native American ceremonies, but the kind used in group therapy sessions or other group discussions where things could get contentious. The rule is that the only person who is allowed to talk is the one holding the talking stick. While only one person can physically hold the talking stick at a time, having only one person at a time talking requires that all the people in the group follow the rules. There is nothing that physically prevents an inconsiderate person from interrupting and talking over all the others. C++ mutexes are similar in that regard. While the implementation of a mutex makes it impossible for different threads to lock the mutex at the same time, nothing enforces that the correct code is within, wind, with, bleh, is within the area where the mutex is locked. An inconsiderate or more likely inattentive programmer could fail to lock a mutex, leading to data races and other bad things happening. As with the talking stick, for a C++ mutex to be effective, all threads involved need to cooperate and follow the rules. In the runway example, the mutex is not a physical thing. It's a process. The pilot of the plane needs to get permission to use the runway from air traffic control. 
It is the process that air traffic control and pilots rigorously follow that prevents the planes from using the runway at the same time. In C++, mutexes are implemented by a variety of classes. The main one, and the, and the one most often used, is stood mutex. The interface for mutex is quite simple. It's all about locking and unlocking. The lock member function locks the mutex, or acquires the mutex. If the mutex is not locked, lock returns quickly. If the mutex is already locked, then the lock call will block and wait until the mutex has been unlocked. Either way, the call to lock does not return until the calling thread has successfully locked the mutex. A call to lock can never fail. It might hang forever and never return if you have a deadlock situation. But if it returns, then the, mute, then the locking was successful. The trilock member function is the non-blocking form of lock. If the mutex is not already locked, trilock locks the mutex and returns true. If the mutex is already locked, trilock does nothing and immediately returns false. It is up to the caller to check the return value and proceed accordingly. The unlock member function unlocks the mutex. It is up to the programmer to guarantee that the mutex was locked by the same thread that is calling unlock. If the mutex isn't locked or if it was locked by a different thread, the behavior is undefined. It is critical that unlock is called every time the mutex is locked. If a call to unlock is forgotten, the program will grind to a halt because every thread will hang the next time it tries to lock the mutex. These are the only portable member functions of stood mutex. A mutex is not copyable or movable. There is no way to ask whether a mutex is locked or which thread has locked the mutex. It is assumed that the program will use a mutex correctly. If mutex is misused, such as forgetting to unlock it, there is no way to detect that and recover. Mutexes have one synchronization rule. The return from a call to lock synchronizes with any previous call to unlock on the same mutex. Since synchronization is all about the visibility of memory, the rule is restated in terms of memory in the second bullet. Any memory changes that happened on thread one before it called unlock are visible to thread two after its call to lock returns. If thread one writes a value before calling unlock, then thread two will read that same value after its call to lock. To show this with code, thread one calls lock and unlock. A little later, thread two calls lock and unlock on the same mutex. Even if thread two's even if thread two calls lock while thread one owns the mutex, thread two's lock call will return after thread one's call to unlock. So the call to lock is considered to happen after the call to unlock. By the rules of mutexes, thread two's call to lock synchronizes with thread one's call to unlock. That means everything that happens in thread one before unlock is visible in thread two after its call to lock returns. Things from sections 1A and 1B are visible in sections 2B and 2C. No other visibility is guaranteed. Section 1C is not visible anywhere in thread 2. Nothing from thread 1 is visible in section 2A. Nothing from thread 2 is visible in thread 1. I'm going to pause here for a few seconds to let this sink in. This is important. Make sure you understand this. This is the key to being able to reason about concurrency. Earlier I told you how std thread works and then told you not to use it. I have just listed all the member functions of mutex, but now I am telling you to never call those functions directly. But at least this time I will tell you what to do instead. Use lock guards. Always, always use lock guards to access a mutex. What are lock guards? A lock guard is an RAII wrapper. Resource acquisition is initialization, one of the worst acronyms in current use. A lock guard is an RAII wrapper around a mutex. The constructor of a lock guard locks the mutex. The destructor of the lock guard unlocks the mutex. Always using lock guards guarantees that unlocking the mutex will never be forgotten and that, un and that unlock will never be called when the mutex hasn't been locked. 
C++ has several standard lock guard classes. The one that you should reach for first when you're using C++ 17 or newer is stood scoped lock. The constructor takes one or more mutexes and locks all of the mutexes in a consistent order, locking if necessary. The destructor unlocks all the mutexes. Scoped lock is not copyable or movable, and it has no other operations. The entire purpose of its existence is to be an RAII wrapper around mutexes. It can't be used for anything else. If you have the misfortune of not being able to use C++ 17, then the lock guard class that you should reach for first is stood lock guard. Lock guard behaves the same as scope lock, except that the constructor takes only one mutex. Scope lock is strictly better than lock guard. You should always use scope lock when you have a choice. If the behavior of scope lock is too simplistic and you need to lock or unlock the mutex at times other than the lock guard's constructor and destructor, then you want to use std unique lock. It has an API similar to mutex with lock, try lock, and unlock member functions, among others. The reason that you should definitely use unique lock rather than using a mutex directly is that unique lock keeps track of whether or not the mutex is locked and calls unlock in its destructor if the mutex is locked. Once again, it becomes impossible to forget to unlock the mutex. Let's pretend for a couple minutes that banking software were this simple to write. In this code, a bank has received information about a debit card transaction and has located the bank account for the transaction. Now the code checks if the account has enough money in it. If so, it adjusts the account balance and sends a message to the merchant saying that the transaction was accepted. If the account doesn't have enough money, the overdraft fee is charged. The user is notified and the merchant is informed that the transaction was rejected. Since it is possible for two transactions on the same account to arrive at the bank at about the same time, we have a data race. The account balance is both read and modified without any synchronization. <clears throat> in the previous examples, we could see the parent thread and the child thread at the same time. In this case, we assume that the code shown here is running at the same time in two different threads. How do we fix this code so it doesn't have a data race? Not like this. This is an improvement, but it is incomplete. The only change, from, the only change to the code is to add scoped locks in both the then and else branches of the if statement. A quick tangent, but an important one. Lock guards must be named variables. The name is never referenced from anywhere, but the name must exist. If you removed the variable name, the code would compile, but it would create a temporary whose lifetime ends at the end of the statement. That means the mutex would be unlocked as soon as it was locked. This mistake leads to data races, and it can be extremely hard to find because it looks, at first glance, like you have all the necessary lock guards. Back to the example. The mutex is locked as shown here, which is the lifetime of the scoped lock object. This avoids the data race of writing to the account balance. The rights to the account balance cannot happen at the same time because they are both in regions where the same mutex is locked. And the synchronization between mutex unlock and mutex lock means the memory is consistent when the writes happen. That's good, but we still have a data race. Reading the account balance happens outside the region where the mutex is locked. That means there can be a read and a write of the same memory location without any synchronization. The fact that one of the threads synchronizes with the mutex doesn't matter. Both threads need to synchronize with each other to avoid a data race. The second problem is that the lines in blue don't need to happen while the mutex is held because they don't access the account. Because mutex contention where threads are blocked on calls to lock can kill performance, you generally want to keep lock guard regions as small as possible but no smaller. This is how the code should be organized to avoid both of these problems. There is one scope with a scoped lock that locks the mutex for the account. All references to the account object are within the scope protected by the locked mutex. And we have a local variable that is set when the mutex is locked 
and is checked later after the mutex is, un is released to send the correct accept or reject message to the merchant. Mutexes are the basic way to synchronize, but they aren't perfect. There's one really important thing to watch out for. That is deadlock. Deadlock is when at least one thread is blocked waiting for something that will never happen. In most cases, that one thread being blocked forever will lead to your entire program coming to a screeching halt. There are lots of ways to cause deadlock. With mutex, deadlock happens when two or more mutexes are locked at the same time, and those mutexes are locked in different orders in different places. We have two threads, each of which needs to work with two different chunks of data. We'll call the data A and B. Each chunk of data has its own mutex protecting it. Thread one works on data A first, then it works on both A and B at the same time. So it makes sense to lock mutex A first, and then later lock mutex B. Thread two does it the other way around, working on data B first, then working on both A and B. So thread two locks mutex B first, and then later locks mutex A. That will eventually lead to deadlock. <clears throat> if both threads reach these blocks of code at about the same time, thread one will lock mutex A, and thread two will lock mutex B. Then after doing the first part of the work, the thread will, each thread will try to lock the other mutex. That's a deadlock. Thread one is blocked trying to acquire mutex B. Which is, already, which is owned by thread two. But thread two will never release mutex B because it is blocked waiting to acquire mutex A, which is owned by thread one. Both threads have come to a halt and there is no way to unblock them or recover from this situation. You must write your program in a way that avoids getting into a deadlock in the first place. Scoped lock can help with that. Scoped lock can take multiple mutexes in a constructor. The magic of scoped lock is that it will always lock the mutexes in the same order, regardless of the order in which the mutexes were listed in scoped lock's constructor. If the two scoped lock variables here, listed here, are defined in different threads, this will not result in a deadlock. Going back to our deadlock example, this is one way to fix it to avoid the deadlock. Both threads have to acquire both mutexes at the same time, using scoped lock to make sure the mutexes are acquired in a consistent order. This means that each thread holds one of the mutexes longer than it really needs to, but that's a small price to pay to avoid deadlock. We are done talking about mutexes. On to the next synchronization method, atomics. This is not about atomics, so I don't have time to introduce them or give an overview. I will just mention how atomics relate to data races and synchronization. Operations on a variable of type std atomic are, as the name implies, atomic. Std atomic guarantees that accessing the same atomic variable from different threads, even if both of those are rights, is not a data race, even if there is no other synchronization. In the example, we don't know which thread will update x first, but we do know that x's value will be 12 greater than what it was before. It is guaranteed that neither thread will interfere with the other's update of x. But not only is accessing the atomic object data race free, accessing atomic objects can synchronize other memory. When using the default memory order, and no, I won't tell you about memory orders, two threads synchronize with each other when they access the same atomic object. In this example, thread one stores to atomic variable x before thread two reads the value of x. Thread two's access of x synchronizes with thread one's access of x. That means everything that happens in thread one up to including the store of x is visible in thread two starting with the load of x. Once again, Synchronization is all about the visibility of memory changes. This must be well understood if you want to be competent at concurrency. Now that we have learned some more ways to synchronize, let's go back and look at some more data race examples. <clears throat> In this example, 
The child thread waits for a flag to be set, then proceeds. The parent thread launches the child thread, waits for a while, then sets the flag. This is a data race. The variable flag is written to the main thread and read in the child thread. And there is no synchronization between those accesses. You might think, okay, but what could go wrong here? The child thread will eventually see the changes to flag. But no. If flag is false when the child thread starts, which it is, the compiler can turn that into an infinite loop. Nothing in the loop can possibly change the value of flag. So the compiler decides that it never needs to load flag from memory again. The child thread may hang on that now infinite loop and the parent thread will hang on the call to join. The data race has resulted in a deadlock. Or using some compilers, including the GCC with the compiler explorer link uses, it'll optimize away that loop entirely and the child thread will just continue as if flag had been set, which is not what you want. We can try to fix this by using a mutex to guard the access to the variable flag, but don't do it like this. Because the lock guard in the child thread wraps the entire while loop, the child thread will hold the mutex indefinitely, and the parent thread will never acquire the mutex so it can set the flag to true. This is not, this is not a data race here, but again, both threads are deadlocked. This is a better way to use a mutex to avoid the data race. The value of the global flag is stored in a local variable so its value can be checked after the lock has been released. We saw a similar technique in the, fight in the banking software. But please don't do this. This is not a good example to follow. A tight loop that acquires and releases a mutex every operation is an anti-pattern. Mutexes are attended, intended for occasional locking, not repeated persistent locking. A better way to fix the data race is to change flag to be atomic. That's it. That's the only change from the original. Because the only data that is shared is of a primitive type, atomic is a good solution here. Here's another example of a data race. We create 100 threads, and each thread increments a global counter 50 times with no synchronization while the threads are running. This is definitely a data race. In theory, anything can happen. But in this case, the most likely effect is that counter will have the wrong value. It will be somewhat less, maybe significantly less than the expected 5,000. We could, in theory, fix this with a mutex, but please don't. The contention for the mutex is outrageous and the performance will be abysmal. Changing the counter to be atomic works better because the overhead of atomic is somewhat less than that of a mutex, but is still not ideal. The problem is that there is simply too many updates to the shared state. A much better fix is to not update the counter so often. Have each thread collect the change locally and then update the shared state only once. That's only 100 synchronization events among the threads instead of 5,000 synchronization events. There are several other kinds of mutexes and lock guards and synchronization classes available in standard C++. I do not have time to go over them in detail, so I will just mention their names and maybe what they are good for. You can easily look them up using the links here in the slides if you think they might be useful. So very quickly, recursive mutex allows the same thread to be locked, to lock a mutex multiple times. This can be useful when you have a thread safe API where some API functions call other public API functions. Timed mutex has methods that allow you to specify timeouts when attempting to acquire a mutex. Recursive timed mutex combines the capabilities of recursive mutex and timed mutex. Shared mutex, also known as a read-write mutex, is the interesting one. It supports two kinds of locking, shared locks, also known as read locks, and exclusive locks, also known as write locks. Any number of threads can acquire a shared lock at the same time but only one thread can acquire an exclusive lock. This is useful when a chunk of data has many readers from different threads, but few writers. An example of a shared, walk, shared mutex is a highway. Many cars can drive on the highway at the same time. That's the shared lock. But when the highway needs to be repaved, the road crew needs to get an exclusive lock. While the road crew holds the exclusive lock, no cars can drive on the highway because they can't get the shared lock. There's also a shared timed mutex that adds the timeout locking functions to shared mutex. Shared lock is the lock guard that you want to use 
when you want to acquire a shared lock on a shared mutex. If you want an exclusive lock instead, use scoped lock or any of the other lock guards. That covers the other mutexes and lock guards. Now on to the other synchronization tools. Stood condition variable is useful when some threads are waiting for a condition to be true and other threads cause that condition to be true. Condition variable has an API with complicated rules that must be followed precisely, so use with care. An example of a condition variable is people lined up outside a store waiting for it to open in the morning. They are blocked waiting for the condition of the store being open. When the time comes, a store employee will unlock the door and call out, we're open now. That will unblock the customers one at a time and they will go through the front door. Because as I mentioned earlier, two people going through the door at the same time doesn't work well. Stood counting semaphore is a lightweight synchronization primitive that can control access to a shared resource. While the method names acquire and release and the fact that acquire can block may lead you to believe that this is similar to a mutex, it is much more flexible and usable in many more situations. An example of a counting semaphore is the check-in desk at this hotel. A hotel employee who starts working at the desk calls release. When you show up and want to check in, you call acquire. When the call to acquire unblocks and returns, you step up to the clerk and check in. When you are done checking in and head to your room, you call release. When the hotel clerk is ready to be done with their shift, they call acquire and leave their post when acquire returns. Stood latch provides a way for some number of threads to synchronize the completion of a shared task. When each thread is done with its part of the task, it calls arrive and wait, which blocks until the threads would blocks until all the threads have called arrive and wait. Then all the threads are unblocked at the same time. Stood barrier is like a reusable latch. Once all the threads have called arrive and wait and every, everyone is unblocked, the barrier is reset and starts the process over again. A team of workers doing lawn care and other basic yard maintenance acts like a barrier. When each worker is done with their tasks at the current yard, they arrive at the truck and wait. When all the workers are done and arrive at the truck, then everyone is unblocked and moves on to the next yard and the process starts over. I've spent the entire C++ part of the talk discussing CPU threads within a process that communicate with each other via memory. But that is not the only way that software engineers do concurrency. Before I conclude, I wanna spend a minute or two looking at, other, at things other than threads. The details will be very different, but the principles and the questions that you need to answer when writing concurrent code are similar. First, let's think about separate processes running on the same machine and working together to achieve a shared goal. A build system such as make, especially a parallel make, but not a distributed make, fits this description. There are plenty of ways that the process could communicate, processes could communicate with each other. But the easiest one might be through the file system. If two processes want to read and write the same set of files, how do they synchronize with each other? How does one process know that the other has finished writing to the file and that everything it reads from the file is up to date? I don't have the answers to these questions. The C++ st standard doesn't have a file system equivalent of a mutex that I can point you to. You might have to resort to operating, systems, operating system specific approaches. But if you're working on an application involving multiple processes, you need to think about this and figure this out. If the processes are running on different machines that don't have a shared file system, the situation is different, but the questions you need to answer are similar. If the processes communicate via network connections, then the reasoning about synchronization is probably a little easier because the data being passed around is explicit and you don't have to scan the code to look for which memory is accessed or changed. But the reasoning is similar. You need to reason about what information is available to what process at what time. Another kind of logical thread of execution is a GPU thread. I can only speak about NVIDIA GPUs here. I don't have enough experience with other brands to say anything meaningful. 
GPU threads are very different from CPU threads, and the rules for synchronization are different. I can't really tell you what the synchronization rules are because they depend on how threads are related. There are different synchronization primitives with different effects based on whether the threads are in the same warp, the same block, the same cooperative group, or the same grid. You still need to reason about which thread has which information. But with GPU threads, that reasoning becomes more complicated. <clears throat> in conclusion, concurrency is hard. It will take you a while to get the hang of it. Don't be discouraged if at first you struggle to understand what is happening. But please, please don't write safety critical concurrent code until you do understand concurrency well. Use the parallel algorithms whenever they do what you need. They are easier to use than hand-rolled concurrency. You still need to avoid data races, but the scope of the code in question is smaller and easier to reason about. Most of all, avoid data races at all costs. Remember that data races are all about what memory is visible to what threads after synchronization. Remember this slide. That wasn't a question, that was a recommendation. To avoid data races, you need to understand how synchronization events affect the visibility of memory changes. That is the key to understanding concurrency. Once you have found a data race in your code, you need to get rid of it. The best way to do that is to share less data between threads. You can't have a data race if there is no shared data for the threads to race to access. For the many cases where you can't eliminate the shared data, you need to add synchronization. Mutexes and lock guards are the most straightforward way to add the necessary synchronization. But there are many other synchronization techniques that may be better for your situation. Let's say that a few weeks from now, you are doing a code review. Based on what you learned in this talk, you notice that a data race in the code you notice a data race in the code being reviewed. You point that out and suggest that it, can, that it can be avoided by locking the mutex in these two places that seem to have been forgotten. Congratulations, your trip to CPPCon has been paid for. Data races are extremely expensive bugs because they are so hard to detect and to debug. Avoiding such a bug is well worth the price of a conference registration. So I have about three minutes left be time for a question or two, if you want to come up to the mic. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering for the STL parallel algorithms, do you need to worry about the size of the amount of data that you have to process? Like, is it always a win and, and it will select for you whether it's worth to parallelize or do you kind of need to think about that? It is not always a win. Measure, measure, measure. Um, normally, the bigger the data set, the more likely it is that parallelism will be beneficial. If you have a really small data set, the overhead of creating the threads and managing the, 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 that'll overwhelm the actual time. Thanks for the talk. Um, very good. Uh, there's something in the parallelism TS right now called async object. Uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. There's a similar, similar class in Boost, um, which kind of wraps up the whole idea of like if you have a vector of whatever. So people that have more complex data things like a vector of whatever might want to consider looking at the async object pattern. It wraps the mutex and the release and the lock guard all up in one. Okay, so Jeff said, look at async object, which is maybe standardized someday. Soon, probably. Hi. Uh, we also have OpenMP and P threads, and now we have standard uh, library threads. So how to choose from them to decide what to use? Uh, OpenMP and OpenACC and many of the libraries are focused on, at least OpenMP, yes, and OpenACC are on parallelism and taking your for loops and making them parallel. Uh, Yes, if, if those are available to you, study them, learn about them, try to use them, they can be very beneficial. 
Um, and there's a bunch of other libraries out there. Like I said before, I'm not familiar enough with them to say anything about them. Some of them are tasking libraries, which are concurrency, doing a bunch of different things at the same time. Some of them are focused on parallelism, taking a computation and splitting up into parallel threads. Um, now that you have some basics about how to understand and reason about concurrency and parallelism, you can probably more likely understand them as you learn about them. But I can't tell you about them all here. Okay, um, before we go, uh, let's see, I said the slides are already up on the Discord channel. And I have one parting thought. Concurrency is all around you. You already know how to deal with it. Take the techniques for managing real world concurrency and synchronization and apply them to the software development part of your life. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the ride. <laughs>